Hello, I'm Jo Hales from Nupsala and we're joined today by Jason Lowe from Monika Vet down in New Zealand. Thank you very much, Jason, for your time. Oh, you're welcome, Jo. Thanks for having us along. Yeah, it's certainly interesting times on the global stage, so I think we're all getting used to video conferencing. Yeah, so I'm a, in a charge of Manuka Vet. I also run Innovative Medical Solutions, which um, does some other research and clinical work. Uh, I've been a veterinarian mostly in the equine space for over 20 years and now based in Cambridge in beautiful New Zealand. So I'm here to talk to you today about Manuka Honey. Um, so just want to go through, I guess, what you need to know and how to use it. Um, Joe, you might have some questions as we go along. Um, and I think the key for people to understand really is that Manuka honey is different to other honeys. Not all honey is the same. And it's really, a, it has specific antibacterial activity. It disrupts biofilms on wounds. Uh, and it also modulates the inflammatory process into wounds. So those are the three key differences that Manuka honey can provide. So just to run through um, the slides here that I prepared. So what makes the Manuka honey special? Well, it is the, the, this plant species, Leptospermum scoparum. That's only really grown in New Zealand. There's around 87 species of Leptospermum. Mostly the others are in Australia, where it's known as the jelly bush. And there's a lot of controversy at the moment around the identification of that, that species and whether Manuka honey could come from, from those other plants. But we know going back into the genetics of it that the Leptospermum scoparum is quite unique. Um, and I've done a lot of research on that. And what they're looking at is protecting the Manuka brand, very similar to what you do with your Scotch whiskey in, in the UK. Um, champagne it really can only come from that geographical location to be called Manuka. And what's cool about it is it contains methyl glyoxal, and that's really responsible for that antimicrobial and those other um, properties that Manuka brings. And it's what's called the non peroxide activity. So all honeys have a peroxide activity, but Manuka has a non peroxide activity. So we'll run through that. Um, and it's really that level of methyl glyoxal that um, relates to that. And that's equivalent to what they call the UMF factor or unique Manuka factor. Now that's literally a trademark. Um, that was sort of the original research behind Manuka was done by a, a guy here in the Waikato in New Zealand actually called Peter Molins. And that was, a, he was contracted by a big commercial firm to work out what was happening with Manuka. And he identified what they called then the unique Manuka factor, trademark that. But since those days, back in the 70s, it's now been identified that that is MGO or methyl glyoxal. To be really effective in wounds, it needs to be over that 350 milligrams to be therapeutic. Certainly greater than 500 milligrams um, per kilo of honey becomes quite superior in its medical activity. Um, and we can get even higher levels than that. And so it really relates to that antimicrobial activity of the honey. So the key for people looking at stuff is really the authenticity of the honey because that UMF factor, UMF number has been really um, plagiarized around the industry because the value of the Manuka honey has become so great. Uh, actually recently a one kilo tub of honey sold in China for over three and a half thousand US dollars. So wow. literally liquid gold. Um, so there's a lot of commercial sort of um, incentive, I guess, to try and cheat the system. So you really do need to be careful about what you're, what you're actually buying and, and read the label. With the, um, with the labels, we've got a lot of owners over here who will go to the local health shop and buy some Manuka honey very, very cheaply. And sometimes they will look like they have an OK um, factor on the outside of the bottle. Can you explain that for us, please? Yeah, so... It's a deliberate strategy by those companies to try and, I believe, trick people into buying it. Now, that said, there are a lot of, there are genuine Manuka honey companies out there. A company called Manuka Health was voted the most trusted brand in Australia recently, and they also appeared on the Good Morning America show, where they were one of only four New Zealand Manuka honey companies that independently test verified their honey. So, um, so I guess, you know, 25% of us are genuine, <laughs> but there's certainly some disingenuine companies out there. So again, just be really careful what you're actually reading. The numbers 
can be confusing um, because they just randomly put stuff on. So unless they're certified by the UMF Foundation, um, it's just their own made up number. And I've also heard that some of them will add the high level MGF factor honey, but then dilute it with other honey or other substances. So in the UK we had, it was just a standard honey, but they found they were adding glucose syrup to it. I think that's correct. Um, just in, as a sort of bulking agent. So again, I imagine the same thing happens with the Manuka honey that if it looks cheap, it's probably cheap for a reason. Absolutely. And look, this is why the New Zealand's trying to step up and trademark and protect the Manuka brand globally, because it's the same as your Scotch whiskey. Um, I believe something like 90% of the one brand of whiskey sold in the Chinese market is counterfeited. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of commercial incentive out there. So, yep, cheap bulking agents, um, adding the chemical so that it's not natural and genuine. And that's fine. MGO itself will have some benefits, but it's all those other benefits of natural honey that you'll get as well. So that you'll be missing out on. So I think you're right. I mean, this is some photos here of the, the land block where we produce the honey from. Um, this is down on the west coast of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, it's pretty remote. We are a partnership with a Maori iwi group. There's around 1,500 hectares of this pristine bush. All the hives are taken in by um, four-wheel drive track, which can be up to a three to four hour drive one way. <laughs> um, it's pretty rough country or we helicopter them in. But it's blocks like this that really give you the opportunity to produce real high-grade manuka. Um, the honeybees themselves, they, don't, they fly within five to six kilometres of the hive, depending on the weather. Um, so essentially we block them into, put them into the middle of these big blocks of standing manuka. So almost force feed them the manuka, um, but that really concentrates it into the hives. The hives get taken off site through the winter because there's just not enough food in there to, for them to survive. Um, so it's quite a, a managed farming system. We also do manuka plantations and we're just trying to, um, yeah, just make sure that there's enough quality manuka trees there to, for them to feed on. So mm -hmm. it's quite seasonal. It's a horticultural industry. So you get one good season out of five or six. Um, so it fluctuates quite a bit. So, like you say, quite a lot of effort. But yeah, magic, magic part of the country. Um, so I guess, yeah, what is, what is honey? Well, like I say, so all honey has these generic properties on this slide. And these are the so-called peroxide activity. So honey is made up of sugars, and mainly fructose and glucose. It's also less than 18 percent water and that water is really tightly bound to the honey molecules and the sugar molecules and what that does it desiccates bacteria so all honey will do that it just starves them of water essentially the glucose oxidase converts um, into gluconic acid and that creates a low ph range so again and that process also releases hydrogen peroxide and we all know that hydrogen peroxide is, is cytotoxic Obviously, not only just to bacteria, but cytotoxic to other healthy fibroblasts and other cells as well. But obviously, in a wound healing environment, there's you know, you've got to balance that up. All honeys also have, because of those high sugars, they have a good osmotic grade um, that causes osmotic shrinking of the bacteria. So that's why they all honeys will have some antibacterial activity um, and also promote that autolytic debridement. Um, that low pH also reduces the activity of the bacterial prote proteases um, and other sort of growth factors. So yes, all honeys will work. Um, and as you said before, even cheap honey will work to a degree. Um, but I think that, you know, I've been probably working with honey for only three or four years now, and it's certainly changed the way I practiced. And yeah, all, all our customer feedback is, wow, this stuff really works. And that's the difference between a, uh, just a honey and a high grade manuka honey. Yeah, I, um, I've i used honey on wounds since I've probably about 25 years ago. I worked with a vet um, locally, a very, very well renowned vet called Alan Walker, and he used honey on wounds and had some brilliant wound healing times, um, just debriding them and then using honey. Um, I started practice using honey and then I came across manuka honey and I noticed a big difference in wound healing times. 
and it was they they were healing quicker. I um, then moved practices and we had a manuka honey which actually had 20% paraffin in it. And my fault for not reading the label correctly, um, it, it definitely noticed a, a reduction in my um, uh, if wounds were taking longer to heal again, then changed to a high grade manuka honey, your, your honey, and it improved again. So I think there is definitely, you can visually see a difference in wound healing times. I think you've got some papers later on um, just to prove that as well. Yeah, yeah, look, absolutely. I think the best paper that I've come across, and, and I'm sure you'll share the link to people that want it, but was the, the um, Equine Bed Education Review um, that came out a few years ago with Andrew Dart. Um, and that, yeah, like you say, there's a lot of science behind this now. So, and I think once you actually use it in practice and clinically, you do see a difference um, mm. really quickly. Um, and yeah, just to summarise some of that science, I guess, uh, yeah, what is, what, is, what is unique about Manuka honey? Um, you know, it has its bacteria um, static against gram-positive organisms, um, also gram-negative organisms, where it disrupts their, their gene expression. Um, it down, down regulates the protein um, uh, around the bacteria as well and gene coding. So, and all this is around, you know, it has, has been shown um, scientifically. Changing the cytokine regulation, and that's around that angiogenesis and actually modulating that inflammatory process in wounds, which I think is really interesting. Mm. Um, and activates toll-like receptor 4 on monocytes. Um, so again, just that through that inflammatory process and the early healing in the wound. So that comes back to those three key benefits of Manuka that you'll get over um, normal honey, that it's antibacterial, it disrupts the biofilms and alters that inflammatory profile. So I don't know, have you seen this, um, this graph here? This was published yeah. in the Wine Wound Management book um, by Christine Thoreau and Jim Schumacher. I think this is a fantastic um, graph. And for me, I, I certainly use it in the clinic when I'm talking to um, the, the graduate students and stuff just around wound management. It's such a common thing that we get in, in equine practice, doesn't it, is to get called out to the cut leg. Um, so I guess just to, to run through it for people, um, these sort of line graphs are, are, are laboratory animals, essentially, companion animals, small animals. Um, so obviously we get hemostasis. Um, and the red line there, then we get that acute inflammatory phase showing through with the brown line and then moving across and get my cursor to work onto that blue line is that proliferative phase. And you see in laboratory animals, that's sort of finishing off around 14 days before we get into the remodeling phase. Now, I think any of us that deal with horses, especially um, understand just how all these things stretch out in time. And that's due to a number of factors, obviously, that equine wounds are highly contaminated, usually high-speed trauma injuries. Um, there's a lot of um, ischemic necrosis in that as a result, and, and that deep you know, bacteria and muck push deep into the wounds. Um, they also have low blood supply. That can be affected as well by their age and their, their own health and condition. And I know, you know a lot of us battle with patients with Cushing syndrome and stuff like that and all things to bear in mind around wound healing. But these solid graphs are, are, are horse related. So again, you can straight away see how you know, suddenly that inflammatory phase can be pushed out for a week to 14 days. Uh, the proliferative phase, as we know, that, that opportunity you have for proud flesh to develop. Um, and then the remodeling phase, which can take you know, well over 21 days and often months in, in some poorly managed wounds um, to, to actually go through. So I think that's a really good graph to actually picture in your head. Where is the opportunity to, to intervene and where can we actually help these wounds heal not only faster but also better? And I think as well, there's, there's something around that where we look at a lot of wounds that might be around joints or tendons or ligaments and you get unnecessary scar tissue around there, does that affect the performance of the horse? And potentially it does, you know, it might restrict its movement, it's not moving as freely, it might start offloading and cause lameness somewhere else. And I think, um, and obviously not only that, but the aesthetic value for resale um, and even in that yearling sales environment or young horse sales environment. So 
lots of opportunities eh, to actually get in there and, and um, affect that healing process, which I think is where Manuka honey gives us quite a powerful tool to do that. Certainly not saying that Manuka honey is the right thing for everything, um, because but it's understanding those phases of wound healing to know when it's right and when it's wrong and when you might need something else, when you might need um, surgical debridement or um, when you need other products there. That sort of makes sense? It does, yes. I'm a great fan of surgical debridement, as some of my colleagues will know. If, um, if it looks like it's beginning of a hill or a mountain on the edge of the wound then I usually if I'm there as a visit anyway then I will surgically debride it or just roughen the surface up to get a little bit more blood to the area and then I find that in conjunction with the manuka honey heals them beautifully. Um, if I've made it bleed a lot I'll just apply compression for a while and then take those dressings off and then apply the manuka honey with a separate dressing afterwards so that's just my preferred preference to doing it but it seems to work. Yeah, look, I think we all get our own systems and our own ways of doing it. Um, and sometimes we can be sort of hamstrung by our practice environment, can't we? Because, you know, the difference between popping out down the road five minutes to a stable or that you're there every day at anyway, compared to driving an hour or an hour and a half up the A1 or something to, <laughs> to, to see a small pony with a wound. So, you know, it's just not practical and cost effective for the client to, to be there yep. every day like you might want to but and I think that's where honey you pretty much can't go wrong the biggest issue really would be with exuberant granulation tissue because it's it, it promotes that angiogenesis so once you've got that granulation bed um, and it's healthy and clean your risk of bacterial infection from there is, is basically negligible or gone um, and you don't want to exacerbate that granulation tissue so I agree with you that's the time where you're, you're going to get proactive with your surgical debridement potentially you know, a good tight wrap or putting some um, some cream on that might have a cortisone in it or something just to restrict that and, and slow it down a little bit if you need to um, but I agree I think you know just managing them proactively is key so this was yeah so what to look for in manuka honey for wounds i guess this comes back to to some of your your, your other comments earlier on but yeah you want it to be sterile and that's again a big risk of um, just buying honey off the shelf this was a study actually done in scotland i believe by carnworth et al 2014 so 18 out of the 29 samples were actually from supermarkets were contaminated with bacteria and fungi so Mm. not actually helping the wound if you do that you want those levels of mgo greater than 350 that's therapeutic um, and that's been well proven uh, and that's equivalent to this umf of 12 um, or above so again just be you know, people need to be aware of have properly been able to interpret the label and i know it's confusing it really frustrates me and, and my colleagues and the people in the industry trying to do things right um, but you need to trusted source essentially and a trusted brand look out like you said for diluted products um, there's again it's relatively unregulated around that for labeling especially in the human side interestingly enough it's it's tougher to, to get veterinary medicines labeled than it is to get human medicines labeled I think the regulators assume that humans can read so they can look after themselves and so a lot of these products like you say will have cheap fillers in them paraffin glucose syrups they might have a number on the front but then when it's actually diluted it might be half or, or less than half of the activity that it purported to be and you see that quite commonly. I found um, something quite interesting also was um, looking at the sort of colour of the honey um, so your honey and the others that seem to be uh, that are the high um, MGO factor they have got um, a, quite a dark colour Whereas, for instance, the one with the paraffin, it's much, much, much harder to get out of the tube. It's a much paler colour. And with some of the ones you can get from the supermarkets, if you read the label on the back, you can see they've been diluted. So, it, as you say, it's exactly that, just reading the labels really clef, uh, cleverly and making sure that you see what's in there. And as you say, you know, your honey from the supermarket will improve your wound compared with nothing, but the Manuka honey will definitely make it, um, it will heal it quicker and be a better product to use. Um, yeah. 
hence why it's a little bit more expensive because it's a very expensive product to produce. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, a little bit goes a long way. And that's what I'm surprised that I've got my little tube here, actually, which I've got in the first aid kit at home for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, I think that's probably, yeah, it lasts a good six months. And that's with a couple of kids running around outside and grazing knees. So a little bit does go a long way. We have the same um, first aid kit for the kids as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah very much so the diluted product definitely something to look out for i've got some other stuff shortly around some of those other factors we look at to, to actually be called manuka which like you say is actually around um that, that color and, and consistency and everything um so it needs to be sustainable and traceable um again um there's been a lot of pressure from the australian manuka industry um trying to to sort of trade in on our manuka name so and there are a lot of sort of wild bees they don't have a lot of um, plantations in that going that yet they don't have a very mature honey industry um, and it's again understanding that bees actually only fly six kilometers from a hive so sort of putting a hive in the middle of a of an area and okay there's some manuka up there but bees aren't going to go and preferentially feed there um, yeah. they'll still go to clover and flowers and stuff much happier than they'll go to manuka so it's not specifically location based either mm -hmm. um, we put our product in a tube rather than a jar i felt as a veterinarian myself a tube was much cleaner yeah. um, you could actually do it one-handed you can squeeze some out onto your um, dressing and then you just flick the top, put it back in your in your pocket, and then you've got your two hands to finish the bandage. And, and mm -hmm. that. whereas scooping your fingers into one jar, all right for the first time, but I think we all know how it looks after that. So I think it's something to to consider. And a trick for getting it out is if it's really cold, it can crystallise. So keep it somewhere that's slightly warm. So you've got a heated tack room, maybe pop it in there. If it's in the vet's car, maybe keep it in the front of the car rather than with all of your drugs at the back. It just keeps it warmer. So if the temperatures really do drop, it's less likely to crystallise and easier to put out onto your dressing. Yeah, yeah, very much. Honey doesn't like to change temperature rapidly is the key. Um, and like you say, that can exacerbate crystallisation. Um, crystals are a, a sign of quality honey because it's that nice yeah. high concentration of sugars. Um, but obviously it makes it a lot less usable that said it's still effective um, but it's just not as nice to to use definitely we've done a lot of work on the processing and we use a cold processing technique now some other firms will um, warm the honey up to to process it and get it up to around 60 degrees that mm -hmm. can and they sort of call that a pasteurization temperature as well um, but that can actually accelerate the chemical reaction in the honey and so it shortens its shelf life, potentially denatures some of the other chemicals and that in there as well. So, so this is a little graph we did, I guess, just looking and, and trying again to um, just to show some of the, the younger veterinarians out there around what are we actually trying to do with wound healing? What are our opportunities to engage in their influence, how it heals? So what properties do we want in our topical products for wound healing? Or drawing water into the wounds, good. Debriding dead tissue is really good. Um, ideally, allowing oxygen into the wound. And I think oxygen's a big one, and I'll talk about that briefly when we talk about getting bandages off and letting air into the wound. Being antimicrobial, being inflammatory modulating, non-toxic, etc. So as you can see there, I mean, honey ticks all those boxes. Um, there's lots of other different products that we use on wounds and, and can be really good at certain times of that wound healing for specific processes um, but like I say I think as a as a all-in-one you know go-to treatment honey's going to do 90 95 percent plus of your daily wounds in practice yeah. and it's easy for owners to use as well um, yeah it's non-prescription so you can give it to owners especially at the moment when you can't get out to see horses it's a nice safe thing that you can give owners to use very much so, and, and no competition withdrawal times, no worries about the stray tube in a, in a tack room at the race yard or the competition yard that's going to trip people up. So. so like you said, does it work? Well, yes, I'm a believer, you're a believer. I think there's a lot of people out there now, but don't just believe us, um, you know, believe the science. And there's some really great work and it, it 
you know, an amazing amount of work that's been done now um, out of the UK and out of um, Europe and out of Australia um, and obviously out of New Zealand as well. Um, so yes, wounds do retract less, remain smaller and have healthier granulation tissue. Wounds heal faster, decreased inflammation, increased angiogenesis, overall wound healing times were superior in high UMF um, treated wounds. So some really cool studies, um, quite, a lot of them quite basic, just doing punch biopsies on the dorsal cannon, treating them differently, having left and right control versus treated, untreated wounds. Um, rubbing contaminants into them, all sorts of things. So, again, all the references would be available, I'm sure. A lot of science behind it. I think the interesting one in the second to bottom there around that increasing the tensile strength of wounds, and it's certainly what we find in practice is that quality of wound healing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's we deal with a lot of young thoroughbreds, that's the main basis of our practice. and. New Zealand sells a lot of horses. We're a breeding ground for selling. So that sales presentation is key for us. Um, yeah. We also live in a, you know, our horses are outside all the time. They're running around in 20 acre paddocks. There's hot, there's flies. They get a lot of wounds. And what our clients really appreciate is that quality of wound healing. The wounds stay supple. Well, they heal yeah. faster, they stay supple, they get hair growth back, and they don't tend to re-injure. And that's where, you know, I don't know how you've found it in practice, but we'd, we'd always sort of get a young filly or something that constantly seemed would kick a door or lash out at something and she just opens the same place up again and again and again until you end up with this horrible scarred mess. Um, whereas the, the honey certainly improves that quality of wound healing. So. And also, as you say, something like in a racing yard, if you can keep that horse in work, albeit a reduced level of work, then that means they'll be back out racing sooner um, or you know, whatever they're doing, be it a show horse, an event or whatever. If you can get that horse back up and running or carrying on walking um, while treating the wound, then that is, uh, is very important for owners. Absolutely. And I think that's where the cost benefit comes in, isn't it? Like you said before, okay, the high quality stuff is expensive, but it works. And if it's a week quicker in healing that wound, well, that's just, you know, it's another bandage change or it's another week out of competition or, or yeah. rest it up and restrict it. It's, it's a huge cost at that other end. So, mm, no, it does make a big difference. Um, obviously, the ones uh, near a joint or anything like that. Obviously, I would I would advise the owners to keep still. But a lot of the others, yeah, being able to keep them in work is is very um, valuable to the owners. So, um, no, I I love the honey definitely. So thank you for introducing it to us. So. Yeah, that's all right. So that last study, a uh, couple of studies there, just around like Titus externa. Um, mm. And, and companion animals and some really cool work against Pseudomonas types infections. And, and again, um, I know with some of the a vet over here recently had tried it, um, she had a, a clitoral infection in a mare that she used the honey with because it was just showing up chronic Pseudomonas. Um, and it, and it sorted that out for them. So with the otitis externa, how are you um, applying it? Are you applying it into the ear canal and then washing it out at a later date, or how are you? How yeah. Are you so what the vets are doing is is putting basically a mill into a small five mil syringe and then just diluting that with a bit of sterile saline and yeah. making almost a wash with it. Yeah, dribbling that down the ear, giving it a good lavage, and obviously mm -hmm. then let the dog stand back and watch them flick it out um, but yeah it's 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 really effective and again um, I've got a, a UK veterinarian working over here actually she's a specialist in dermatology and, and she's been using it quite extensively and, and again getting owners to comply to it she finds really good because they seem to enjoy the whole concept of something that's natural um, yeah. it's not antibiotic it's something that they can use regularly um, in managing those sort of chronic otitis infections that you'll get in some of the working dogs and hunting dogs. Yeah, how to use Manuka honey. Well, again, this was a, in the DART article that I mentioned before in EVE. Um, so obviously, to bride it, apply your Manuka honey. Now, what we recommend is applying the high-grade stuff initially. Um, first, you know, within 24 hours of injury. So again, great for people to have in their first aid kit. Um, and we really recommend that for the first 12 days um, and what you'll find is you'll get a really good debridement, you'll kill out the bacteria, you get that healthy granulation bed coming in, 
and forming. And then you know, say that the, what we tend to do is, is after the 12 days, actually look at trying to remove the bandage. Now I understand that every wound's different and there's gonna be some that you can't and some you have to restrict and stuff, but just as a, as sort of a guide in your head, I think the temptation I see with a lot of the young vets that come through our practice is that they want to bandage it until it's got hair back on the on the wound. But what that's doing is it's restricting the oxygen, and that's really important in that sort of final healing and maturation phases of the wound. It needs oxygen to finish off. And yes, it's going to swell a bit, but tell your owners that it's going to swell a bit. Give them a bit of anti-inflammatory or something. You know, let the wound go through it, actually. And as you said before, get the horse moving a little bit. Some of these chronic sort of incipient wounds that just sit there and do nothing. They actually need a bit of stimulation, like you say, physical debridement or actually just exercise and, and walking will start stretching and getting the body moving again and, and things healing. So I think that's one of my big things um, is around, yeah, people bandage far too long. And if it is applicable to take the bandage off, then actually that reduces the cost to the owner a huge amount as well, doesn't it? So you know, bandage so materials, they, they require a visit and vet's time, but also the bandage materials themselves are soon mount up. So if it's yeah. suitable to take the bandages off, it um, can be very good financially for the owners as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing, it's just going back to the basics of your clinical studies at school and, and saying, well, what does a bandage actually do? What are we trying to achieve with that bandage? Um, mm -hmm. And once you're through that, say those risk periods of infection and and stuff, then actually a bandage isn't serving a lot of function at all. It makes you feel better and it covers it up so the owner can't see it, um, but it's actually not needed. Yeah, uh, band then, ones I've bandaged have been, if, if it is a wound where I do want to reduce the movement because say it's near a joint or anything like that, a horse that's likely to contaminate the wound um, a lot, a horse that lies down in the stable a lot and is having to be stable, then it, it, you know, it's sort of balancing it out, isn't it, between the benefits and the disadvantages of bandaging. So, and as you say, every case is different, but it is, it's useful that um, you've got the two products as well, haven't you? So that the, um, the Manuka honey cream will be more likely to stick to the wound without needing the bandages. So, and that's yeah. helpful. Yeah, that's right. And that's why we design them like that, obviously, and, and with the, it's the insect repellents and the cream as well. So it's very much that topical, you know, the owner can do it two or three times a day, keeps it subtle, supple, keeps the fly insects off it, and it just allows it to finish off nicely without that intense sort of management. Mm. And I guess this is sort of, to me, this sort of treatment plan is probably designed for your typical dorsal cannon, dorsal hock degloving injury that we all see so commonly. Um, they're pretty straightforward wounds to manage um, once you've, like you say, excluded other synovial structures, etc. Yeah, so I think that's a good rule of thumb. I think the changing bandages um, as required every one to five days, again, I think you just have to be brave enough eh, and actually, you know, analyse what's going on and it depends on how the animal's been managed and as you said, what sort of horse it is, is it going to kick its bandage and it's going to drop and tighten or, or something like that or is it really tolerant horse and you can leave them on for I always sort of you know try to get away three to five days and try and avoid changing bandages at weekends and stuff like that mm -hmm. um, so yeah it, it does vary but every time you go there you just reapply and, and you'll see those wounds heal pretty well. I agree I think most of the ones I've done I've changed about twice a week as a guide and obviously sometimes in the acute phases you need to go more often um, sometimes you'll have a horse that's really good or an owner who can apply their own bandage depending where the wound is and then you can maybe see them once a week um, and then the owner will do a bandage change as well so it's um, every case is different but I do think yeah you don't need to be changing them that often with the honey because obviously you've got the antibacterial agents there and but yeah with that taking common sense depending on the wound yeah that's right and i think again obviously some people listening might want to you know you can get quite involved with the types of dressing you're using you know non-adhesive and non-absorbent and absorbent etc but you know i sort of found that again once you're through that acute sort of debridement phase and and 
clean the wound up, then you actually just don't want something to stick on it. You want the normal healing process to happen. And you usually got a lot of protective absorbent layers with your Gamgee or, or cotton wool. Um, so yeah, and a lot of discharge in horse wounds as we know. Um, so just assessing it on that too, isn't it? As to how much of all those things are happening. So yeah, so I guess that brings us to why Manuka Vet. Um, it might be a bit small for people to see, but it was really just the concept, I guess, again, back to, to, to product quality. Um, there's a lot of testing that goes on in New Zealand now. The industry is highly regulated um, as, as far as actually what qualifies to be called Manuka. Some of the bigger issues are coming as we ship it offshore. So they're looking at stopping um, bulk drum shipments now out of New Zealand and looking at your only be shipping packaged goods in their final container for consumption. A judge recently in Australia walked out of a judging competition because she said this isn't Manuka. <laughs> um, so they have quite lapsed um, yeah, regulations there. So we test the honey extensively. We test it for a product called DHA. Um, dihydroxyacetone in the early stages when we harvest and what that actually predicts is where the MGO levels are going to get to so honey is actually a little bit like wine and it will mature it takes about one to two years to mature in the barrel and that's when we then take it out process it into tubes and get it onto the market it's a normal curve so that will continue to increase and then eventually it will start to decrease and that again depends on storage conditions temperatures etc like that we have all independent certified um, laboratory testing. We do all the stability and shelf life through an independent laboratory. Um, it's all GMP certified manufacturing facilities. Uh, it's, yeah, you can be guaranteed that it's, it's the genuine stuff um, and that it's properly tested to, to do what it says on the label. It, all gets the same when we export it, it all comes under government guidelines for export and stuff. So what are our products? I guess just quickly, we've probably talked on this, that the gel, um, that's the high medical grade gel, 500 plus MGO, very much that first 12 days of the wound healing on average. It's sterile, it's ultra filtered. Um, it can be safely applied to any wound under a bandage. Um, and like I say, for the management in those early stages, comes in a 20 and 100 gram tube. Our cream product, um, which is 80% pure honey, and then it's got 20% paraffins and some natural oil inset repellents in it. It's still in total a 350 MGO level, so it's still therapeutic. Um, again, sterile filtered. We say that it's not recommended to be applied under a bandage. Really, if you're bandaging, you should use the gel product. It's probably not going to do any harm, but it's um, it's not really what it's intended for. And this is sort of a more, like I say, if you're owner to carry on in those later stages. So I just have my head 0 to 12 days is the gel, then 12 to 21, obviously 21 just being the inverse of 12. It's a nice little um, sort of formula to, to follow roughly. The other thing I like about the um, the way it's produced is the fact you've got the little flip cap on it. Some of the Manuka honeys that are very good quality over here have got like a little, you twist the cap and then have to place the cap back on. It's just sort of a on off that can easily lose the cap or it can get dropped and things like that. So um, I do find that the vets, uh, I like it and the other vets who are using it really like the fact that it's just a snap lid. If you want to get a large amount out, you can just untwist the lid and just put it directly onto the dressing. But there, it's a very easy to use. And as you say, a little bit goes a long way. So often you only need for the beginning of the wound, unless it's a large wound, you can get away with just using the small sterile honey. Um, if it's a larger one, use the big one and then the owners can leave any leftover in their first aid kit. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's a real opportunity for clinics to do a little wound package and you could have a tube of each. And, and that it, there's enough in there to treat a normal 10 by 10 centimetre wound, which is your classic dorsal cannon, dorsal hot, big love. Um, it'll treat that to healing. So, yeah. you know, it's not that expensive. And like you say, if you can get those cleaned up in 21 days or thereabouts, you've saved, you know, you've saved more than that in bandage changes and ongoing. So. 
um, and appreciate the feedback on the flip top tube. It was certainly something that I personally did a lot of research and been a practicing vet. It was like, it's so frustrating, isn't it? When you've only got two pairs, one pair of hands as to <laughs> what you can try and address a, a horse that's been a bit annoying or something. So yeah, look, I think it is. It's, it's a great product. It's simple. Um, it really does work. And and I agree, it's certainly changed how I've managed wounds and how I've, I've tried to teach other people to manage wounds better. Um, I think it's a, a great tool in our toolbox and so the science is there and it's, it's actually really extensive. Um, so there's an extensive reference list there if people wanted to look or, or look up that EVE article, um, a review on the research into Maluka honey. Perfect. Um, no. It's good to have, I think you've got another couple of slides with references on, so it'd be good to just flick through those slowly and then people can pause yeah. them, take a screenshot and uh, look up any that they're interested in. So I don't know, any, any other questions or? I, I think we've covered a lot, thank you. I, I'm a big fan of Manuka honey and have been for a long time and a big fan of your Manuka honey. So I've tried it on wounds on my own horses. Um, I have a thoroughbred who likes to self-harm on a regular basis and uh, he managed to cut his um, heel and went through the coronary band, took off a large section of um, the back of his foot um, with nice fiery and the manuka honey on the wound above um, with stitching as well. He was back in work within five weeks and that was a horrendous injury. Um, and you know, it, we, we were delighted with that. And the hoof capsule, you can just see where the damage in the hoof capsule was, but um, only just if you're looking for it, you wouldn't notice otherwise. So, and the wound across the bulb of the heel, you can't even see that at all. Um, so yeah, no, and it was, it was like, I don't know how he did it, nothing in the field to see, but um, it was, he must've got his foot caught somewhere. Um, probably in a gate or something, but um, yeah, it was a nasty, nasty wound and yeah, it, it healed beautifully very, very quickly. And what's happening in the UK with sort of antibiotic stewardship? Because again, I think one of the beauties of, of, again, one of the reasons or strategies behind Manuka Vet was, was this move away from antibiotics. Is that getting sort of traction and getting stronger in the UK? Um, yes, it is. Yeah, we've got, um, I think a lot of vets are very aware of antibiotic usage. Um, I certainly am. And owners are as well, which is nice because a lot of the time an owner would ring up and say, I've got a wound, I need antibiotics. And actually, even the ones who are still doing that, if you explain, actually, it, it maybe doesn't need them. Obviously, depending where the wound is, the contamination levels, etc. But a lot of them are happy to use honey instead where appropriate. So, um, yeah, I think um, vets are, are very aware of it. So um, at the moment, we've got a lot of telemedicine going on, obviously, without being able to go and visit the horses. There's a lot. Um, it'll be very interesting to see going forward whether any of the rules and regulations allow some of that to continue um, but the nice thing about the honey is um, as long as you don't think that wound is near a joint and you've got a competent owner who'll be able to clean it you might be able to just see it the once um, or maybe not even at all and it's something safe that you can give you know will do a good job yeah look i think there's so many i know there's a paper at the aaep this year around honey on colic incision wounds again reducing infection rates on those because obviously always a real difficult area to manage and dehiscence and those sort of wounds is catastrophic. Um, we've done some research work recently, uh, I hope I'm not out of line here, but on intrauterine use of honey and what was really interesting was the anti-inflammatory benefits so it looks like we've, we've improved their biopsy scores um, which I think is that yeah, inflammatory modulation. And so I think there's lots of opportunities there and you know, we would like to take the, the product and the companies just to explore some of those and probably more into almost the application um, devices because like you say, treating ears and dogs and things like that can be quite frustrating and difficult. So, um, I presume with the uterine, intrauterine use, you'd have to dilute that as well because you have to be very careful about um, you know, leaving any crystals and how, how do you how have you been doing that in the experimental uses yeah so it was literally 50 mils of, of pure honey um, and going in now it was being diluted with another 100 mils of water and just using water so we're not sure how that had affected it um, affect the efficacy 
But saying that, we haven't seen any, the, the bacterial cell counts, so uterine culture before and after treatment was no different in the antibiotic treated group compared to the honey treated group. I guess there's a lot of work around, you know, is it even bacteria that are causing the problems in sort of um, post breeding problems with mares and stuff. So it's, yeah, we, we got to analyze some of that data. Um, but I say, I think it's, Personally, I, I guess I'm hypothesizing, is it more the inflammatory modulation? And that to me would fit in with the autoimmune nature of those post-breeding problems mm -hmm. rather than being a true infectious process. Because realistically, I mean, stallions are not clean, are they? <laughs> and, and in the normal process, it's, it's, a, it's a dirty thing, but most normal mares would cope with, with clearing that. So it's... Yeah. it's no, it'd be interesting to see see the research on that one. It's um, when you've analysed the data, definitely. Well, thank you very much, Jason. That was very, very informative. As I say, I'm already a convert, but hopefully it'll give more information for more vets to try the honey and see see how they find it. Um, it's available at Nipsala Pharmacy. We've got the um, the large gel, the small gel, and the um, Minucovet cream as well. So if anyone's interested in any more information, contact us at Nipsala and we can send you client leaflets, um, leaflets for vets, and um, we can support in any way we can. But yeah, thank you very much, Jason.